Wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, I appreciate being here today. Uh, thank you to A and B for the opportunity to join this wonderful community, this wonderful group here. Um, I, I'm going to keep it relatively informal, um, so it's going to be more of a uh, dialogue conversation. And then I do want to have those questions at the end for any questions that that anyone may have to to address that as well. But it'll be fairly informal. Uh, my name is Chucha Revelo. I am the founder of Spark Business Academy. Uh, a little bit, just very brief intro. Um, I, I grew up in Spain. Uh, I ended up going to college in, in London, um, England, you know, learning English and the like. Um, I met my wife there. We came to the, to the U.S. as American. You know, once we came back to the U.S., uh, came to D.C., we love, fell in love with D.C. and we've been here for 30 years. Um, you know, uh, so very excited to, to be here. Um, I um, studied economics in college. Then I worked here in, in, at an economic consulting firm here in D.C., Economist Incorporated, uh, working on uh, mergers and acquisitions and antitrust. Then I went to, uh, back to school at Georgetown. I got my MBA in finance at Georgetown. And then I worked for 20 plus years at uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, in the financial services consulting group, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, and, and it was around that time that I, that I started thinking about Spark. You know, I had gotten a couple of certifications, charter financial analyst, charter holder, certified product examiner. I was always looking to... How can, I, how can I better myself and learn more um, about, about finances? Because I thought it was such an important part of everyone's life. Um, so at the same time, my kids, you know, we've been in Arlington for 30 years. My kids went to, you know, Arlington Public Schools. They went to uh, uh, York, uh, uh, Taylor Elementary, Williamsburg Middle School, uh, Yorktown High School, you know, had a wonderful experience there. Uh, I coached uh, kids sports for many years, soccer and basketball. So I spent a lot of time working with kids. And around the time, sometimes I would talk to them about, you know, my, my work in, in finance and some of the questions that I had for, for them. And even though they were bright kids and they went to great schools and, you know, they got good grades, most of it just kind of went over their heads. So then it became apparent to me that kids were not learning uh, they're learning a lot of important things in school, like math, science, and history, and English, but they're not learning some what I call life skills that can really help them become what we like to call global responsible citizens, you know, being financially responsible and things of that nature. So, um, so essentially, that, that became my mission. Um, and, you know, just let me start by, you know, two weeks ago. Um, you know, uh, there was a study released by uh, MIT uh, that basically showed that 80% of young adults, which they define, you know, as age between 18 and 35. Um, so, you know, high school, college, uh, you know, early in your career professionally, between 18 and 35, 80% of, of uh, folks were either struggling financially or mere, merely surviving financially. Now, 80%, that's an astonishing high number. Um, obviously, 80% of the folks basically means that, you know, they're, they're feeling some financial stress, some sort of anxiety. Um, that basically, uh, you know, we know from many studies and surveys that, the number one source of stress at work and, and even at home, but especially at work, is, is money. Um, and by the way, this applies to all ranges of income. Um, you know, I remember a study that, you know, some law firms had done about their, their, their associates, and they found that their uh, kind of senior associates, attorneys, like they had been at the law firm for, you know, five to seven years. They were not partners yet, but they were experienced associates. Uh, their number one source of stress was money. And these are folks making $250,000, $300,000 a year. And you figure like, hmm, you're making that much money. How can you be stressed out? But it doesn't really matter, right? We know that a lot of professional athletes, they're making millions of dollars a year and they ended up, end up uh, going broke. So it doesn't really matter how much money you have. 
it's more of a being savvy about uh, financial responsibility and some of the financial decisions you have to make. So what, what this study showed me, this was the, the study from MIT, about 80% of young adults, you know, being uh, struggling or mirror, mirror surviving. It, it's, just, it's just another data point of, of many, right? Uh, this anxiety that these folks are feeling is not the best, it doesn't create the best environment to make sound financial decisions when you are super stressed out. You know, this means that, you know, th these folks, again, 80% is a high number. They're probably not in a position to buy a house. You know, they probably have to wait longer than their parents and their grandparents did in order to buy a house. They may have a lot of college debt. Um, they're not, uh, a lot of, many of them may not be investing intelligently enough. They may be actually too conservative uh, and, and, you know, when, when you have a shorter time horizon and, and you're older in age, it's okay to be more conservative, but when you're young and you have the long time horizon and benefit from the time, uh, you know, benefit of, of compounding and, and the, you know, the, 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 the fact that things compound quickly over time, that's when you need to be a little more, uh, aggressive or smart about chasing higher return investments. But yet we're seeing many young adults, they're, very, very conservative, which is an opportunity, is a missed opportunity. And all of this is because of the, the risk. They don't want to take the risk, right? But there are ways of doing that. Um, so again, this, this study is just the latest data point that I've seen over the years uh, about essentially that strongly suggests to me that not just now, but over the last 15, 20 years, or probably even before, um, that there is a hidden crisis I think we have a crisis, you know, in, in the U.S. in general, and not, not just in Arlington, it's probably the case in, in everywhere in the U.S. and probably the world, that there's a crisis of finance, uh, that basically to me, there's a, a hidden crisis of financial illiteracy, meaning adults, young adults, older adults, they're lacking the, the tools, the insights to make those those basic financial decisions that all of us need to make at some point, whether it's coming up with a budget, uh, should I buy or rent? You know, what kind of mortgage should I get? Do I, should I buy a car? Should I buy a new car, a used car? How do I start investing for whether it's retirement or, or what are my financial goals? There's a lot of decisions that, uh, that need to be made. And sometimes this can be overwhelming. So what often happens is that, you know, we, we take the ostrich approach, you know, stick your head in the sand, don't think about it and hope it goes away. And of course, that only makes things worse. So, so you know, th this hidden crisis, I call it hidden because, yeah, every now and then it'll be in the news, there's studies here or there's a survey there, but it, it's not being given the importance that it deserves, I think. Um, you know, and, and, and I think not much is being done about it. So, you know, just thinking about the impact of, of this sort of hidden crisis of, of financial illiteracy, not, not everyone, obviously, it's not 100% of the population. There's a lot of smart people making great decisions, and, and I'm sure we have many of them here in this group. But in general, I think there, this, is, this is a problem. So, and, and we can look back in history about other data points. Um, for example, COVID, right? The COVID pandemic, one of the biggest unforeseen events in, in our lifetime, uh, or at least over the last 20 years or so. Uh, how is that related to financial literacy? Well, a lot of people lost their jobs, right? And, and it was a really hard time for a lot of people, uh, wreaked havoc on, on many families and finances. And, you know, many of those folks who were affected financially probably did not have the, the sort of contingency fund that is usually recommended um, as, as kind of an emergency fund to help you get through unforeseen events. And obviously the COVID pandemic was a really big unforeseen event. Imagine uh, someone who lost their job and all of a sudden, you know, the, there's no paycheck coming. That's a real tough situation versus someone who's like, okay, I lost my job, obviously very, not a good situation here. However, I do have my six month 
worth of living expenses in my contingency fund. So I, I'm, I'm stressed because I feel I just lost my job, but I, I feel a little better because you know I'm not as uh, stressed out because I know it, it buys me a little bit of time having that contingency fund. That's one example, right? Going further back, 2008, 2009 financial crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, again, um, you know, all of you I'm sure remember, a lot of people lost their, their homes. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason is, well, a lot of people probably got bigger houses or more expensive houses that they needed. Uh, maybe a lot of those buyers did not understand how the variable mortgage rates worked, how maybe they were very low at the beginning, but then they, they could go up and did go up, which meant that they, now they couldn't afford to make those payments, now you lose your house. So obviously that's not that far, uh, not so distant in the past as well, 2008, 2009. So that's another problem that, that we've seen. Uh, we have, I think in general, society has a toxic relationship with credit cards, um, which you know uh, many people uh, get in trouble using. And credit cards, of course, as we talk to our, students, they can be wonderful tools and, you know, they can be great ways for you to build credit, um, you know, help, help your credit scores, obviously has the convenience, uh, you know, there's uh, rewards and miles and things that you can benefit from, but you need to be able to know how to use them prudently. And unfortunately, I think more people, more often than not, get into trouble with credit cards than, than not. So, that's a problem because credit cards, as, as most of you I'm sure know, you know, they're charging like 20% interest rates. So unless you're paying them off every month, you, you get into a, a hole that is very hard to get out of when you're paying 20% interest on, on, on the balance. You know, some people end up just making the minimum payments, which means they're not really chipping away at the balance and they keep paying for way too long, et cetera. So again, another example. And, and I think we have, you know, and I've noticed this maybe coming from other uh, countries and other cultures that in the U.S. there's a, just a, a general culture of overconsumption, uh, which is fine if you can afford it. But I think it puts a lot of people in trouble. Just, oh, go to the mall and, and buy things, you know, kind of like a pastime, you know, rather than like, you know, it could be a hobby instead of like playing sports or playing cards or whatever or cooking or whatever may is going to the mall and buying things. And I'm gonna buy another pair of shoes. I have 10 pairs, but I'm gonna buy another one. So why do, why do we really do that? And I think that's a little bit of a mindset. And part of it is, you know, you can talk about, you know, you know uh, advertising and, and, and things of that nature, but I, I, this overconsumption can be detrimental in, in many ways. Um, and, and, and the kids, tying it up to kids, you know, kids pick this up. Like I've, I've been at the mall and I've seen, you know, a mom working with a little girl, a little boy, and they say, hey, mom, can you buy me this toy? And the mom would say, no, I don't, I don't have any money. And the kid would say, but you have a credit card. So even young kids, they pick up on things like that. They see you using credit cards to buy things. They don't see money being exchanged as much these days or in the last few years. They don't realize the value that you have to work to, to earn the money. And then that allows you to buy things. Um, so, so that type of uh, anecdotal uh, evidence that, that I see at the mall, it just, I think it's also telling. You know, we have the Amazon effect where it makes it so easy just to buy things on Amazon and kids see, you know, brown boxes appear in, their, in your doorstep every, every few days and more stuff come in and they don't see how you're paying for it. Of course, they don't see the bill that comes at the end of the month. Um, and I think, you know, this culture of overconsumption, that's something that, that parents need to try to rein in a little bit with their kids to, you know, the different things we do when we talk to our kids about making, you know, fun games, going to the grocery store and, and see if we can buy dinner for less than $10, you know, or, you know, let's look at the cereal aisle and which cereal is on sale. And, you know, if, if we like these two cereals and one of them is on sale, well, let's buy the one that is on sale so that we have money left over. And just little things like that can help start uh, creating a, a mindset of, uh, you know, uh, being a little more mindful about, about money and where it comes from, right? 
So hopefully that's a little bit of a background about, you know, how, you know, th these are sort of the, all the reasons why 10 years ago I decided to, you know, uh, leave my job in finance and launch Spark to essentially promote this life skills with, with kids. And, and so let's get into, into that a little bit more. You know, as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking like, well, I, I see all these problems, right? Overconsumption, credit cards, um, you know, um, you know, 2008, 2009 crisis, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, things like obviously medical care and, and things like that kids don't really see going to the doctor, you know, just going to the doctor can be very expensive as you get older, that, that continues to grow that expense. So, so, you know, one root cause of this is that, um, you know, unfortunately, most of us learn about our personal finances and, and what to do and what not to do. Unfortunately, most of us learn about this the hard way through mistakes that we make. And I've seen that so many times. So many parents have said, oh, I'm so glad my kid has this class. You know, I wish I had this class when I was, or I always had this summer camp when I was young. You know, I kind of learned things the hard way by making mistakes. And I, I hear that all the time. And I started thinking, well, uh, and again, I, I could reference my own kids when they were in, in at Taylor Elementary, you know, a wonderful school. Um, and I would talk to them and they just didn't understand. So I said, well, A, schools are not really teaching kids about basic financial literacy. B, we as parents don't do a good job talking to our, to our own kids about money because it makes us uncomfortable. It's been a taboo subject for, for many years historically, right? Um, I, I see, I think now, you know, more parents are maybe you know, it's getting a little better talking to their kids about money a little bit more. But historically, I mean, certainly my parents didn't talk to me about money at all. So, um, so that, you, so then I, I said, well, if they're not learning in school and they're not learning at home, they're not learning it, right? And then we go and send teens after they finish high school, they're like 17, 18, and we send them off on their own without any preparation about how to, handle or make these decisions. They don't really have the required preparation or the tools or the insight. So no wonder that they, they, they're on the college campus, they see the, the, you know, the balloons and the free pizza that the credit card companies are offering. And yes, they're gonna go there and they're gonna sign up for the credit card and they don't realize what they're signing up for. So, um, and, and, you know, so, so this became kind of obvious to me that, that this hidden crisis that something needed to be done so then basically that's i said you know what um, this is going to become my mission and about 10 years ago that's what i did um i started developing programs to make things uh relatable to kids because you know i got a lot of pushback initially saying well kids don't understand about money or that, that's more of an adult thing or or you know maybe when you're in college you know but not before and i said well why when you're thinking about learning how to play an instrument, lear learning a foreign language, learning sport, really learning anything, the younger you are, typically the better. Kids do a great job learning, you know, piano, violin, whatever, learning, you know, different languages, playing sports. So I thought financial literacy shouldn't be any different. It just needs to be taught in, in a certain way that it's fun, and 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 relatable to kids so that's essentially what uh what i've been doing for the last 10 years with my team and the way we we do that um you know it, again we're based here in arlington virginia so we're local uh, my you know my kids went to the local public schools and my goal became to really empower the next generation with what I call essential 21st century life skills um, that all of them are going to need to to use. And this is not about, you know, becoming a financial genius or, or, you know, becoming a millionaire or anything like that. It's not about that at all. It's more about having the, the insights and the tools to make the 
to make the financial decisions that every person needs to make, you know, coming up with a budget for your household, you know, like we talked earlier, you know, you need to buy a car, okay, buy new, used, et cetera, mortgages, rent versus buy, start to invest, your FICO score, which obviously is hugely important. You know, we talk to our fifth graders about your FICO score, you know, what does it mean, you know? Um, so, so the way we do this is, we partner with a lot of schools. Uh, we partner with Arlington Public Schools, many of them, Fairfax County Public Schools, Montgomery County Public Schools, Alex City of Alexandria Public Schools, for Falls Church, a lot of schools in the area. We also partner with the independent, the private schools, you know, the Sidwell Friends, you know, GDS, uh, Potomac, uh, Beauvoir, NCS, all of those, you know, high performing schools in, in the area. Um, so we partner with them. We partner with youth organizations like the Girl Scouts. They have a wonderful, uh, every, everyone's seen like the Girl Scouts selling cookies and the like. They do a wonderful job with their batch workshops. And so we facilitate a lot of the financial literacy workshops for Girl Scouts. Um, you know, the Jack and Jill is a similar organi youth organization. Um, that has different chapters throughout the country. So we work with them a lot. And then we, you know, we frankly work with sometimes private, um, fa you know, families that, you know, they call us and say, hey, can you run a, a camp or a workshop for, you know, my, my, my son and I have a few neighbors and we have like eight to 10 kids who would like to learn about investing, uh, for example. So So we can do that as well. So that has been, you know, very rewarding in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the interest that that kids have shown. Uh, parents um, are seeing increasingly the value of kids learning about these things at a younger age to the point, like I mentioned earlier, many parents would tell me, I wish I had, you know, this class when I was growing up or, you know, and then a lot of parents actually start saying, well, you know, my kid is actually teaching me some things, you know, my, my sixth grader, my seventh grade, they're teaching me about some of the things that I'm learning, you know, so, so I realized that I need to learn more about this too. So we're actually, you know, we also started doing financial wellness programs for, for adults uh, because they, you know, the, some adults, they need it. They still, they feel like, well, my kid knows this stuff, but I feel like, you know, I don't have a budget. You know, I don't have my, you know, financial house in order. Like, you know, my, you know, I don't know if I should refinance my mortgage or no, whether I should get a reverse mortgage or not. Oh, I don't know if my investments are the right investments right now based on when I want to retire or like, oh, what I want to do with my, with my life or, you know, what financial goals I have long-term, short-term, um, you know, so, so we do that as well uh, with basically the three, what I see the three pillars of, of financial wellness, which again is, is about reducing your financial anxiety, right? And there's three main areas. One is budgeting, right? Which relates to the money in, money out, um, you know, have, have paying bills and the like. So budgeting is obviously, a, 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 you know, one of the big ones. The second one is debt management in terms of managing your credit card debt, your mortgage, if a, 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 a car loan, uh, folks who may have um, student loans, student loans is, you know, it's becoming, you know, $1.5 trillion, trillion with a T in outstanding loans. And, and that's the one type of debt that you cannot eliminate through personal bankruptcy. So that stays with you forever. But $1.5 trillion, actually higher than that now. Uh, that is just amazing. So sometimes we talk to families about, well, you know, it, it's great if you can afford an Ivy League school, fantastic. But if you cannot afford that, there are other ways that you can do it. Um, you know, you don't have to pay 60 grand a year to go to college. You can, there's creative ways of doing that. You can maybe go to a community, community college for the first couple of years, you know, do a good job and then transfer to, a, to another school. And you, then you graduate from that school. And to me, that shows a path of uh, someone who's a hard worker and has, and makes things happen. So I don't think that would be that would be viewed unfavorably by a potential employer. So I, the opposite, quite the opposite, I think. So, so again, uh, talking about you know the, the the budgeting, the the debt, and the investments. You know, those are kind of the three pillars. So 
lot of parents are asking about that. I just had a conversation with, you know, a, a parent who, you know, their their kid is off to college and basically said, can you work with, with Ethan, um, you know, once a week or so, because he's been in college for a month and a half and already his finances are out of control, you know, and that's an example of, well, you know, we send kids on their own without any preparation. What, what do you expect? The, you know, we shouldn't expect them to be able to make these decisions without the necessary preparation. So, so, um, so that is that is something that you know when I when 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 we hear that type of uh, need, I think I think that needs there and it's always been there, and it goes back to being a hidden crisis. Again, I don't think it's getting the attention it deserves. And and studies like the MIT study that just came out a couple of weeks ago. You know, they're obviously highlighting what I've what I've been kind of saying for the last ten years that there is this hidden crisis here. Um, you know, one of the things that drives me when doing this, and and you know, besides our programs in Arlington, we actually have programs in like twenty two states. We have programs in New York, um, you know, Florida, Texas, California, uh, Connecticut, Maine, like many different states, many different schools. And, and we really see how kids really uh, understand this. Again, one of the uh, uh, pushback, some of the pushback I got initially 10 years ago is like, oh, well, you know, you can't talk to a third grade about this. You know, they need to be at least like high school or college. And I said, well, no, I disagree. I think you can definitely talk to a third grader about this if you do it the right way. So, you know, we might do things like, Okay, so, you know, if you have $10, uh, you know, what can you do with $10, you know, and talking about money choices and helping them understand. I'm like, well, you, you can spend it, right? You know, you couldn't spend it. What else can you do? Well, you know, some kid would say, well, you can save it, you know, fine, you can save it, great. Uh, what else can you do? Well, you can donate it, right? Um, so then we have different uh interesting ways, engaging ways to, for kids to start understanding, okay, so I have money choices. I can, when I have money, I can uh, spend it. I can save it. I can donate it. Um, you know, when, you know, we have them make piggy banks and have a different piggy bank for each of the three choices. So, you know, and then it's, okay, so if you have $10, how would you split it between how much would you save? How much would you spend? How much would you donate? And again, all of this is different and personal because it's called personal finance for a reason. There's no right or wrong answer. But the main thing is that you understand what it is that, that you need to be doing. And when we work with slightly older kids, then we bring investing, which of course could be a type of saving. Uh, so they actually have four different buckets, saving, spending, investing, and donating. So, so again, you know, we see that even first graders we have programs for kindergartners who you know understanding the concept of money and some of the games i've mentioned before they start to get it and the point i think of starting with kids is that it's hard if you don't talk about these things and then when you're 25 you want to start learning of course you can and totally fine but it, it becomes a little harder if you're working through this since you're like five years old then when you're 18, 19, 20, it's not a foreign concept. It's almost like second nature that, you know, yeah, okay, I understand. I've been talking about this for the last, you know, 14 years. So it's not it's not a foreign concept. Um, and again, it's not about becoming a financial genius or anything like that. It's more about being able to have the, the tools and the insights to make those decisions that, that everyone is gonna need to make. Um, you know, we have wonderful stories of, uh, you know, kids, you know, moms who tells us, you know, you know, my, my son, you know, we used to talk about like, you know, sports and other things about uh, at the dinner table. And, you know, he took your, your summer camp last, last, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And now all we talk about is like, okay, which companies can, should we invest in? And, and what if, if we invest in this company, you know, how is it, am I going to be able to buy a house, you know, when I'm 30? you know, and, and things of that nature. So, so, you know, we talk about financial goals, which of course could be buying a house, buying a car, college, retirement, uh, buying a boat, whatever it is that, that you know, um, depending on your situation, you know, then we look about, well, those are your goals and how are you gonna meet those goals, right? So, so I think getting that um, feedback from parents 
you know, now this kid is talking to the, because we, that's something we want to do. We want to facilitate conversations at home that maybe up to this point, they haven't taken place. Because again, we as parents have a hard time talking to our own kids about money and money issues. It becomes a little uncomfortable. If we can, uh, and we've been able to facilitate that road, make it a little easier for parents to talk to their kids about money. And, and like I said earlier, sometimes parents tell me like, my kid is, is teaching me things, you know, but like, you know, I, I should check my, my credit score, you know, twice a year, make sure it's accurate, you know, or like, I didn't realize how important my FICO score was going to be, you know, no wonder I was trying to get a mortgage and the rates were so high, especially now that rates are like through the roof. So I didn't realize that if I had a, a better FICO score, I could get a much better mortgage. Uh, so things of that nature, uh, we've had, um, uh, um, I have a wonderful story of a, a, a kid who, a seven-year-old, that one of the programs we have for younger kids, we call it My First Lemonade Stand. And as the name indicates, it kind of helps kids how to run a lemonade stand. We're using a little bit of a business mindset, you know, thinking about what price are you going to charge and, you know, and, and coming up with a logo and, you know, do you want to donate some of the profits to a charity and the like. So we had um, our campers over the last, you know, few, you know, a couple of months, they raised almost $4,000 for different local charities, whether, you know, St. Jude's or Children's Hospital or the local pet shelter. Um, and these are seven, eight, nine-year-olds that are raising maybe a hundred bucks, uh, you know, selling lemonade and then donated to a charity they care about. So I think that's fantastic and that's so empowering. And uh, that's something that we would love, love to, you know, uh, uh, integrate that sort of philanthropic, uh, mindset on, on kids that yes we want you to be successful and you know budget properly and 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 invest and manage your debt but if it puts you in a good situation you can do good and do you can do well and do good at the same time and that's something that we like to emphasize with with all of our programs we had this one kid seven year old he you know was inspired by some of the programs he took and he decided to on his own, he was gonna raise money for the local pet shelter. He loves cat dogs and cats and uh, here in Montgomery County. And he basically on his own, uh, based on kind of what he had learned in, in our program, he decided to, you know, run a lemonade stand in his neighborhood, put up flyers, throw, you know, throughout to gather interest. And he was able to raise $700, which is amazing. And a bunch of like toys for the local pet, local pet shelter, so he shows up, and actually we heard from the from the local pet shelter who called, basically emailed us. It's like we got this kid who showed up with all this cash for for our pet shelter. And we were asking, like, how do you get this cash? And you know, you know, it's unusual for them for a kid to come up with seven hundred bucks and he has a donation. And he told us the story, and and we felt we just wanted to email you and let you know what kind of impact you're having because I think that's wonderful. So so I was like. I couldn't believe it when I read that. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. You know, if we can have this kind of impact on a seven-year-old, you know, today is raising $700 for a local pet shelter. Tomorrow, who knows? You know, you could be doing much bigger and, and, and greater things. So, um, so, you know, so those are some of the, those are the things that keep me, you know, getting up early in the morning, keep me, you know, go to bed late at night to kind of do the work that we're doing you know, coming up with new programs, figuring out ways that we can help, you know, the next generation and, and their parents and their grandparents, you know, face these financial decisions that all of us need to make um, in the best possible way. So, and, you know, and then we have, you know, again, with all the programs we run, we have a, a very strong team of uh, folks who, you know, work with us, you know, we have, uh, you know, volunteers we have people who you know they, they're um you know they, they're uh, they're uh, educators they're sometimes we have like retired professionals or retired teachers who you know they they're still active and they want to do something with their with their lives and, and they work with us and and they run classes at the local school maybe where their you know uh grandkids went and i think that's a fantastic way of sort of closing the loop uh, and having folks stay involved, so that's that's been a, a fantastic way to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, for us to to really tap into folks who share our passion 
uh, for you know our passion for uh, really promoting these skills with with the kids. You know, so again, we have like you know over two hundred and fifty instructors kind of throughout throughout the country, and many of them here in the DC area. Um, and the the programs we run uh, typically at schools, they could be they're typically a number of things could be after school classes, which typically meet once a week for eight to 10 weeks in the fall, winter and spring. So, you know, and once uh, school is over, some kids go home, take the bus, so they get picked up. Other kids stay home and they may do sports or play chess or do art, other things. We come in and teach a weekly class and so maybe for, for uh, you know, once a week for an hour, they're, they're learning about these things. Um, and we have classes, typically schools do fall, winter, and spring. So we may have a, a, you know, a class in, in the fall and a different class in the winter and a different class in the spring. Typically, we have them in groups, like uh, kindergarten, first or second grade in one group, third, fourth, fifth grade in another group, and then also working with middle schools as well in another group. So that's typically one of the programs we run, the after-school program. Then I also mentioned summer camps. In the summer, obviously, kids have eight to 10 weeks that you know, they, they, they are, they have some availability. And I think, you know, 10 weeks is enough time to go to the beach and go to the pool and play sports, but also you could use some of these weeks to learn about these skills, which I think are important, you know, to help you grow personally as a person and giving you these foundational skills that I think, you know, you're going to have. Um, and, uh, and so, so, you know, those are some of the programs we run. We have programs where we come in and spend a whole day with an entire grade, uh, our sort of project-based learning days that, that are also very helpful. Um, and then, um, you know, and then just different ad hoc workshops that, that we'll do again for different, for different ages and, and different groups. I was at, at Yorktown, I was collaborating with uh, the econ uh, the economics teacher, for example, for a couple of years, and I would come in and, and you know, really teach kids about investing in a practical way, because they're learning a lot of the theory there, but we would do, it like, well, let me tell you how it actually is done, and how you can start doing this, like, today, you know what I mean, with practical insights that anyone could, anyone could, uh, could start. Um, so, so, just, so, I think that, that's, it gives us a, a good sort of uh, about the right time, 1046. Uh, I wanted to make sure I leave some some uh, time for Q&A. Uh, just looking at some of the questions here, uh, some of the questions I see, how often uh, these programs run. So again, the after school programs typically run once a week for an hour for like eight to 10 weeks. Uh, you know, we like to do follow-ups uh, to some, again, based on, the, the programs are informal, but we like to see what, what kids are doing. For example, we just got a follow-up from a, a family who they've been taking our programs for a couple of years now, and their kids are now uh, 15. Uh, and they actually wrote a book on entrepreneurship and starting a business. And they're 15 and 16, two, two um, uh, friends, and, and they got the book published, which is amazing. So they've been inspired by kind of the per what they've been learning with us. And they've been able to write, not only write a book, but getting it published, which, which I think is, is amazing. Um, grandparents and adult relatives help teach young people. Well, I think grandparents can, you certainly as grandparents have seen it all, you know, you, you, you know, you, I'm sure you've done things right. And maybe there's, there's some things that you said, well, I probably could have done this better, just like all of us, right? You can certainly, uh, I would encourage all of you to think about uh, you know, with your with their kids or grandkids, there are ways to to help them by a lot of it's by asking questions, you know, and things about like, you know, whether it's like starting to think about, well, if you have $10, what, what would you do with that money? And just get a sense, and if they say, well, I would spend it all, well, that gives you an opportunity to say, well, you know that you can do also, you can also do other things with money. You can save it, you know, you can donate it. So, you know, not to be dogmatic, but you want to try to install, you know, try to instill some, some good habits so that someone is not going to just spend all the money. Because if they tell you, oh, I would spend it all, well, if say they get an inheritance or some bigger amount of money, well, that gives you an indication that maybe they're just going to spend it all. Spend it all. So you want to work with them on, on 
things like, well, remember you can save money for, you know, for the future to help you and you can, that's helpful. And then you can also donate if there's a, a cause that you care about, you can certainly make donate some of your money and, you know, some of you, I'm sure, you know, they, they you know, talk to your kids and, and grandkids about that. So, I mean, I think that's, that's one, that's one helpful way to do it. Uh, I always think taking them shopping, taking them to the grocery stores and like, I mean, let's go shopping and, and see, and then, you know, playing games, like, let's see if we can get dinner for the whole family for, I don't know, $10 or 50, whatever it is, or $20, you know, just to save some money or let's figure out what things are on sale and let's, let's buy those things and make dinner based on those things that are on sale. Um, I always think that we are not teaching kids how to be frugal and to me being frugal, it's good. It's a, it's a good thing. You want to keep some of the money that you have because it doesn't grow on trees. Um, so I think that that's helpful. Um, is it uh, uniform syllabus everywhere for all the state? So yes, yeah, so the programs we run, um, we run the same basic programs, whether it's uh, you know an introduction to personal finance, for example, for grades third, fourth, and fifth. We run that for our schools here in Arlington, the private schools, the public schools, schools in New York, schools in Florida, schools in California, and and you know we talk about basic things like budgeting simulation, just basic budgeting exercises. A lot of it has to be hands on. If you're just uh, lecturing kids, they don't. They don't, it doesn't work very well. It's much better having sort of hands-on activities where the kids are actually learning by doing. So we may have a, a, an activity, for example, about you know the um, you know these two siblings. They're 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 trying to save money for a used car. It's going to be maybe you know five thousand dollars. So basically, they need to come up with five thousand dollars in in two or three years. So how can we help them get there? You know, and then we'll talk about. Well, maybe they get this matching allowance. Maybe they have these jobs. They have these expenses, and we come up with a basic budget, and and then we realize that well, at this rate, they're they're not saving enough. That in two or three years they're gonna be able to buy this car. So what what can they do? Well, maybe let's reduce some of the expenses. Maybe let's uh uh maybe let's they need to charge more for babysitting. Maybe they need to get another job, and then we help them get there. Um, so things like that, they are we teach them basically uniformly at, at different, different states, different cities that we, that we run. Uh, the different levels of financial education. Yes, I mean, we, we typically have an introductory program for like K first and second, which is very basic. We talk about, you know, the value of coins and, and money choices and needs and wants, et cetera. As the kids get older, say fourth, fifth, sixth grade, then we talk about, you know, more budgeting simulations and, expenses, discretionary, non-discretionary. And then as kids get older, like middle school, we talk about investing and things of that nature. So it does progress as over time based on age. Um, so yeah, it looks like the program could be, uh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, right, managing your checking and your savings, uh, sessions in the stock market, uh, loans, interest rate. Um, yeah, I mean, all of those things that you mentioned here, uh, Pat, about, uh, you know, uh, 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 high school course you, you took many years ago. Uh, yes, I mean, I think some of those courses, you know, have, have been there. Um, I, I just think that high school is a little too late to start those things, you know, and typically only until recently, there's only 13 states that require a personal finance class as a requirement for high school graduation. Uh, it's it's a higher number now, but I remember about when I started doing this about, you know, eight, 10 years ago, I remember it was only 13 states and now, now it's more, but I don't think even that it's enough. I, I mean, I think uh, to me, it would be helpful to start early. I, I, the problem is that the curriculum is is jam packed. You know, you have history, science, and you know English, and, and it's just not not a lot of time to to put it in there. So uh, we are collaborating with some schools where we're trying to integrate it into the curriculum a little bit more um, on on an ad hoc basis. Um, and so yeah, so so the schools have lots of different clubs. I see another question: schools that have investing clubs. Yeah, so I mean, I think, again, I, I think high schools, a lot of high, not all, but I think more high schools more and more are, are having some sort of club, like an investing club, 
which is which is great. Uh, these clubs tend to be student run, and you know, and it's a great way to um, definitely. I would uh, strongly uh, encourage you know high school students to join those types of clubs. Sometimes you know it's very much student run, which is great. Sometimes you don't have all the kind of insights necessarily, but you can have guest speakers and and things of that nature to help you. There's a ton of information online, which sometimes is a good thing, sometimes is a bad thing as well. So, um, and, but those are sort of the clubs that we run. Uh, like at Wakefield High School, for example, we run a club like just like that for the high schoolers in collaboration with the, um, you know, the, 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 fine, the econ and finance uh, teacher at Wakefield as, as, as well as the, um, you know, the gifted student uh, resource teacher at Wakefield. So we had a program there that was very, that was very successful. Uh, we've done program, similar program at, at Yorktown and uh, having the, at WNL, at, um, uh, we, we did a program a while back, but, but not, not recently. We've been focusing a little bit more on the um, elementary schools and the middle schools. So, um, so I realize I've been doing a lot of talking, answering some questions, but I think we have a few minutes left for any other questions that may, uh, may come through the chat or verbally. Any questions from anyone? Yeah, I just put one in, which is, uh, how does all of your work get paid for? Do the students that take these after-school programs pay a tuition for them, or do the schools cover them, or? Yeah, you know, so does... uh, so for a lot, for the summer camps, for example, it works like any summer camp, parents sign up and, and pay for the fee. Uh, we partner with the schools. Uh, and the schools they 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 run those uh, programs, and then uh, and then counties like for example we partner with Arlington County, and we have a lot of programs through the county. So the county handles the registration and and the fees for the families and all of that. The after school programs are very similar, the same for the most part. The parents sign up and and pay for the program. Uh, there are some cases where the school will will pay for the program and, and students can, can join for free, which is, which is great. Uh, and we do a lot of financial aid, um, obviously for, um, for families who need it. So, um, you know, we, we obviously don't want price to be a reason why someone doesn't take our programs and it, it never has been. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's how we, the programs get funded. Um, and, and sometimes schools will, uh, sometimes some schools, for, we have a school in Rhode Island, for example, where they, the school district got some COVID related money for, for you know, um, COVID, as you know, it caused a lot of uh, um, issues with, with kids, you know, not getting the education they needed. So a lot of kids kind of fell behind. So there's been a, some money thrown around, like government money for like more like remedial or helping kids get back uh, to, to the level they had in our programs because we we use a lot of quasi-academic skills that have been successful in, in that regard. So uh, that's one example where we had programs there for school in Rhode Island that it was all it was sort of funded by 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 the state and the kids could just go there for free. Now you've been at this long enough that there must be thousands of kids that have been through your programs. Are you able to collect any long-term data showing, you know, here's the, the advantage of kids having this kind of early financial literacy versus kids that don't? That That is a great question. Uh, the short answer is, is not hard data, but a lot of, um, a lot of like one of data where, you know, we'll hear the kids like, you know, I started, you know, I started, you know, my kids, you know, took this program and now started investing. And now, you know, he actually has a portfolio of maybe, you know, a few thousand dollars. Uh, or, you know, we have uh, folks actually who kids who took our programs kind of from elementary school, you know, middle school. And now they're actually working with us as instructors. So they're actually earning money in a way that uh, maybe they couldn't before and some of these kids could be even in, in high school uh, or college uh, but they're 
earning money as instructors, which if you're in high school or even college trying to get a job, you're almost limited to the mall or retail and not a lot of money. And if they're working with us, they're making a difference with younger kids. They they can teach these programs well because they were on the other side as students and they're they're making some good money teaching this program. So that's one way in which uh, it kind of comes full circle. And, and it's just very rewarding when we have uh, someone who teaches, you know, was a student in our programs, now is teaching our programs, they're earning money, doing that way, and they're making a difference like someone did for them when they were young. Any other questions, Gary? I don't see any others. Okay. If anyone has any other questions at any point, feel free. They can reach out to you and they can, you know, you can reach out to me. Anyone has any questions, you can go to the, our website, sparkbusinessacademy.com and submit a question through there as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank Chuchi Arevalo with Spark Business Academy for joining us today. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, I hope our future generations will have all kinds of business skills that they didn't have before as a result of uh, getting your classes. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. And for, for everybody who's on on the call today or on the, on the meeting next week, we're going to learn about RSV. Some of you may have already gotten your RSV shots along with uh, flu and COVID, but maybe you're a little reluctant and want to little, get a little more information. So we'll be hearing from Dr. Michelle Crank. Um, an allergist, immunologist, and internist who will tell us everything we want to know about RSV. So be sure and tune in next week at the usual time, 10 o'clock, and have a good week. <laughs>